Walsh again is well taken care of. Lost in the ball. Irvin is open. Touchdown, Miami. Teams will try to strike deep as they go down the middle, and it is touchdown. Andre Johnson with the ball by him. Six. Going up for four, but it's intercepted near midfield. Sean Taylor's got another one. Who else? What's up, everybody? Welcome to the Canes Insight Podcast, powered by Anajar and Levine Accident Attorneys. I am the money. As you can see, we are live from the Canes Insight Studios, and it is an exciting day. Not only are we going to talk spring practice one, not only are we going to talk the Under Armour camp, both of which I attended, not only are we going to talk to Javi Salas, Mr. Perfect himself, about Canes baseball series against the Gators, but we are starting to go daily starting today. It is a new era of Kane's Insight and the Kane's Insight podcast every day, plus emergency podcast, Monday through Friday. You are going to be hearing from me and Pete on absolute latest in football, basketball, recruiting, baseball, you name it. We'll be bringing it to you, player interviews, recruit interviews, all kinds of things. It's going to be a, a new era for the Canes. But first, I want to thank some of the people that made this possible, starting with Anajar and Levine, accident attorneys, dial one 800 747 free. That is 1 800 747 3733. If you, someone you care about, gets in an accident, you are thinking about a million things. You're stressed out, you might be dealing with something physical. You don't want to be thinking necessarily about a legal case. You want experts to handle it. And you may be entitled to significant compensation. So what do you do? Reach out to Anajar and Levine again, 1 800 747 free, 1 800 747 3733. Three, three. These guys got medical experts. They got investigators to recreate the accident. And of course, attorneys with decades of experience doing this exact thing. So reach out to Anna Jar and Levine if you or someone you care about has been injured in an auto accident. Best part of all, they don't get paid until you get paid. So keep that in mind. Also, want to thank Canesware, our old friends. They got a new spot right next to the spot is Hoagies. It is football heaven. I was just there this past weekend. All kinds of TVs, all kinds of new gear, Canes, Panthers, Heat, Inner Miami. I mean, you name it, they have it. They got the new Canes baseball camo hat, which is one of the hottest sellers right now. You can get it not only at the store, but you can get it at caneswear.com. If you live somewhere else in the country, you can't make it out to Davie, Florida, go to caneswear.com and get that camo hat or whatever product you want. They got tons of stuff, and they are a great partner of the Canes Inside Podcast. Football heaven at Caneswear in Davy or Caneswear.com. All right. So, Pete. Pumped up about this, man. This is a long time coming. I mean, this is, I think this is going to be something really different for the Canes fans. We appreciate everyone who has supported us up to this point, but we're trying to take it to the next level. We've been saying we we're going to do this for a while, D, but I mean, we're fully all in, both of us, and excited to bring the Canes fans a different form of content that I don't think is really out there. Uh, so let's just get right into it, right? We, we kind of buried the lead here, spring practice, day one. First look at Cam Ward, but a lot of other guys that people are excited about. We want to go position by position here, early impressions. It's just day one, no pads. But again, Cam Ward, after the saga was to get him here on campus, finally get to see him in the flesh. And not just him, but Big Poff, right? Um, and a, a ton of other guys. So let's just get right into it, D. Yeah, we've spent the last two days watching football. Thank God. And what is it, March? Watching football back-to-back -back days. That's why we got the tans. You got the burn. Uh, you know, Under Armour yesterday, practice today. Cam Ward. Look, just to be clear, talking to Canes fans, just to be clear, we got practice in helmets, shells, shorts. This is not some prediction on the season or something that is, you can read too much into. It's just first impressions. We're going to go over a lot of just first impressions, physical stuff, just overall big picture stuff. But Pete, Cam Ward, he can sling it. I mean, the guy is a as advertised as a passer. He was throwing it beautifully all day. What you saw on the Washington State film, his ability to throw those 50-50 balls, where he it looks like the guy's covered, but he places it perfectly, allows the receiver to make a play. You saw that repeatedly, whether it was Restrepo, Jacoby George, he is able to put his receivers in a position to make plays. Elijah Arroyo, who we'll get to in a second. So Cam Ward, really the first impression was just this guy can pass. 
It just you had a good passer in Van Dyke. You know, Van Dyke had plenty of passing talent himself, NFL prospect at one point, maybe again. With Ward, it's just a quicker operation, gets rid of it quicker, comes from a system where he's making quicker decisions. You don't lose any arm strength from Van Dyke. And I think you just get a little more finesse with what Cam Ward brings. So day one, but I think everybody feels that they're getting what they expected with Cam Ward. I know that's been the buzz all offseason. Behind him, Reese Poffenbarger. I think that was really almost more anticipated than Cam because Cam, you know really what he can do. Poffenbarger, there's some mystery to it because he's a he's a guy that's coming from the FCS level. I think the first thing when I'm looking at a guy that's making that leap is are their physical skills translating? And with Poffenbarger, the arm strength was there right away. He was throwing it outside the numbers with some velocity and he was getting it there. And these deep, these very fast defensive backs didn't have enough time to break on the ball. He was able to zip it in. So that's kind of the first check mark. But when you're talking about first impressions that are meaningful, if he didn't have that arm, you know, if he was like a, a guy like a you know Candace Smith back in the day, you know, where he's that's not gonna you date the first practice you see, you say this is not gonna happen. No, this guy has the arm strength. Yeah, he's 5'10, but he has some tools and he has some twitch. So that was good to see. And then really the quarterback room in general, when was the last time we had five quarterbacks on scholarship at the same time? You had Ward, who's been a star. Poffenbarg, who's been a star at the FCS level. Emery Williams, who's after that nasty injury, he was out there practicing looking good. He beat Clemson this year. Jakari Harris has won, has won a game, started multiple games at the next level. Jakari, like Jakari Brown. Brown. He's done this. He's done this before. I know. Now you know it's official. Jakari Brown. He's he's started games, and then you're talking about Judd, who hasn't started, but is a scholarship player. I've seen him out there. The guy's physically very, very, very impressive. He stands out. Tall, smooth, and everything. Smooth delivery, athletic. He looked the part. So five guys throwing it. You know they do drills where they're just kind of taking you know, two quarterbacks lined up. They're taking turns throwing routes. Things moving real fast, and you're not stopping with good quarterbacks. There's a good quarterback every single time that can make the throws and has an arm and has some talent. So that, to me, was the big takeaway, early takeaway from the quarterback position. Moving on to running backs, a room that people are excited about. Obviously, you bring a couple guys back, and Parrish Fletcher won't be participating this this spring, obviously, with that injury uh, that he that he got in the in the, in the bowl game. Um, but then you're adding some young guys to that room. Also, a Chris Johnson coming back. Hope to get some good weight on him. Early impressions there, D. Does that look like a room that can take it to the next level? A lot of injuries in that room. So you're not seeing the full picture. Fletcher's not out there. AJ Allen is not out there. Jordan Lyle's not arrived yet from St. Thomas Aquinas. He'll be in the mix. He's expected to play early. And could there be a transfer there? Possibly. So you're missing some faces. However, the guys that were out there, Chris Johnson looked good. He was a starter. He's getting the reps you want to see him get. I know a lot of people want to see what Chris Johnson can do. I'm one of them. We've been talking about it for months on this podcast. So you get him out there. That's a positive sign. Trevante Citizen was the backup. Now he's wearing number 23. And, you know, you couldn't really tell because running backs, you're not tackling, you know, so that's probably the position that you get the least feel for. But he was out there doing his thing. No limitations from what I could see. The guy that kind of caught my eye, was Chris Wheatley Humphrey, the signee from, from South Broward. Because you've been, I, out, you've been all over him for a while. Film is outstanding, but you worry about the size. You say, how's he going to look when you put him on this on Green Tree practice field and there's some big guys around him? And he looked pretty you know, pretty good. He did, he's not going to be a Mark Fletcher. You know, he's a small back, but he didn't look tiny. And he looked like he's gained some weight since the last time we saw him. He was standing right next to Duke Johnson. Duke Johnson, I saw the tweet and, and I was watching him. He's there. He was there. Uh, he's now, I guess, working with the team while he gets Student his degree. assistant, I think is what Mario right. said. So he was standing right next to Wheatley Humphrey, and they were the same size. Wheatley Humphrey probably a little longer, taller, not as big as Duke, but not as skinny as he was when he first got here. He's put on some weight. And then he's got quickness. He's got athletic ability. Yeah, no pads, but you can see him move around. And I've heard some good buzz about him. Now seeing him, I understand where that good buzz is coming from. So that's what the running backs shake out. You know, there's guys missing in action, but you want the guys that are here to 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 make the most of their opportunities. Talk about wide receiver. It's funny. You see George, you know what he's there for. You see Restrepo, 
you know what he's there for and you know what they're about. Then I see this guy number two, six five, ripped. Like I look like an NFL receiver. I'm like, who the hell is this guy? Turns out it's Isaiah Horton changed his number. But I think you, most Canes fans are not going to recognize Horton when they see him because he's been so uh, – he's worked so hard in the weight room in the offseason. He clearly sees the opportunity with Colby Young out at that X position, the ability to really stretch the field and provide a big body um, out there on the boundary. So that's a guy I think has a lot to prove this offseason – or sorry, this spring, really the whole offseason. And then, of course, the season. But I think he's in the right trajectory based on just the physical development he's had. He was able to make some plays, you know, miss some plays. But he you could tell something's different with him. He was almost unrecognizable, not just because of the number switch. Two guys that really caught my attention at that position are the two new guys. JoJo Trader, Nykar. We've been talking on the podcast about sort of the buzz that's picking up on them. Mm-hmm. But – Seeing an action, man. Both of them are smooth. You know, they'll, they'll miss some plays here and there, but Jojo Trader's got the smooth ability to get open. And Nikar, when you put up the production that he's put up in high school, that says something. Receiver is often a production position. You go back and look at these guys that make it some first round, some third round, some seventh round, but they all seem to have crazy production in high school. That's one of those trends that when you do studies, you see. Nikar was doing that at the highest level of Georgia football. And didn't miss a beat today. It was out there making plays. So Nike Carr and JoJo Trader, big names, top 100 players, top 75 players, and they looked the part today. Tight end, I think that's a room that everyone is expecting and hoping for more production out of. You get Elijah Royal back. He spoke to the media today. He said he's feeling more like himself. Riley Williams, everyone, everyone understands the upside that he brings to the table. Saw some flashes last year, but want to see that consistency out of him. Then you have... Of course, um, Jackson Carver is there, but kid out of Nevada, right? I mean, you're talking about a guy coming in as a freshman that does bring you the shades of Brevin Jordan a little bit, but how excited are you about this group as a whole? So it starts with Elijah Royo. He was consistently mentioned as a top offseason performer. I think Cristobal mentioned it today in the post game as well. Big was making contested catches. There's not a lot of blocking going on today, at least full contact blocking because of the pad situation, but he picked up right where you expected him to pick up based on what you've been hearing in the offseason. Riley Williams had a one-handed catch, which I saw uh, others were tweeting about during the open session. Beautiful one-handed catch. Uh, he's going to be a factor. Elijah Lofton, you see him. He's he's definitely six foot six one. He's not tall at all, but he is very, very powerful, powerfully built. You put him at fullback, and he's going to be overpowering linebackers, no problem. He could probably overpower some defensive ends with a low center of gravity. The length is not necessarily there, but he can run routes. He made a couple plays over the middle. He's somebody who is going to have a unique role. He can also carry the ball. I was told he could play halfback at the University of Miami if needed. Maybe that happens this spring. It didn't happen today that I saw, but you know, with a position that's not loaded with guys due to injury, maybe you get some carries. But he can do a lot, and just seeing him up close, yeah, he's not the tallest guy, but he's not small. He is a strong, strong player. I mean, could he be like – I remember C.J. Donaldson a couple years ago went to West Virginia from down here, came out as an H-back tight end, and he ended up being a beast of a running back, uh, West Virginia. You saw him run over Central, meaning you saw Elijah Lofton run over Central as as a tailback, so he can do it. I like him as sort of a fullback. And you hear fullback, you think, oh, we're not going to be Iowa. I don't want this old Big Ten football, but – the San Francisco 49ers use a fullback. The Miami Dolphins use a fullback. You can be the most explosive offense is modern, you know, you name it, offense, and still have a fullback. Right. Especially a guy like Lofton who can not only block but can catch and run and do all those things, line up wide. He can do so much. I like him in that position because when you see him up close, he looks like not just a fullback. He looks mm-hmm. like a big fullback. Right. He'll be one of the bigger fullbacks around, and then you can line him up wide. Yeah. So that's pretty unique. Let's get into the unit that I think most people are confident about under Mario Cristobal and Coach Mirabal. The offensive line, you lose a couple of big-time key starters, Matt Lee, Javion Cohen, which we will get into combine talk later this week, probably tomorrow pretty extensively. Um, Great performance by Matt Lee out there. But you're losing two really important starters there. You do bring some key pieces back, but your impressions of that group today? The spring's going to be a big opportunity for a lot of guys because you're down a few players. 
I mean, we're down all our Samoans. So you got both Mau and Noah's and Tinalau out. I wish we had more depth of Samoan. Actually, we still got Logan Sagapolo, so yeah. I take it back. And he was out there today, but we need more. Um, but with Francis out, obviously, there's a downstream effect. So then you see Matt McCoy playing right tackle. Jalen Rivers still at left. Right guard, Ennis Cooper, who's rock solid. Center, Zach Carpenter, who had a good day and looks big. Looks probably he'll probably be more powerful than Matt Lee. I don't think he's gonna have the athletic testing. You saw Matt Lee, what he did mm -hmm. at the combine. I don't think you're gonna see that from Zach Carpenter, but you know, you're gonna have some strength with him, probably stronger than Matt Lee. Left guard is the position with Mauno out that becomes very interesting. And I think Samson Okalola, if you ask me one of the stories of the day, Samson, who coming off of the injury, not a torn ACL, but a significant injury being ready for spring and playing the practice one. That was not a sure thing. I'd heard mixed things in the mm -hmm. past weeks. He was out there. He was moving well, and he was in the mix. I know, you know, there was a lot of people freaking out because they heard Lou Cristobal was starting at left guard. There are multiple combinations. You know, Cristobal is someone they can trust, obviously, uh, to know what's going on. But I think Samson at left guard is the intriguing option. And the fact that he's ready to play now, meaning in spring – very, very exciting development. And that's an interesting one because everyone always thought of him as a tackle, right, coming in. And you're seeing that guard position. You, you used to look at these squatty linemen, but it, you need length there as well. So that could be a very intriguing uh, move for him for sure. What I think is real cool is that usually you have too many guards. And One time Miami had too many centers. That's right. when things were really shaky bad. when Cristobal first showed up. Some of these have too many guards and you force them out to play tackle because tackles are so rare. I mean, you represented a first round tackle, right? Right. So you know that's a rare position. You get paid handsomely to play it. Very, very rarely, very rarely do guys work at guard and and, and tackle. You got to be special. And there's just not that many tackles around because right. not that many athletic guys like that. There's big guys that can play guards. The guys that are big and athletic that play tackles more rare. Mm -hmm. With the way Crystal Ball's recruited, we have an excess of tackles. So you have rivers. And Mau and Noah starting. Both can play guard also, but they're tackles as well. Very capable tackles. Ines Cooper can play tackle. When he first got here, I watched his first few practices. He played tackle and played pretty pretty damn good. Right. You have Matt McCoy, who's a starting right tackle now with, with Mau and Noah out. You also have um, Markel Bell, who just arrived from junior college, playing right tackle today. Who's, he made Samson look like you know, like Cristobal. And I've been saying it, Mario, I don't think I've heard him talk about an incoming lineman the way that he raved about him in the post-signing day interviews that he was doing. Obviously, there's going to be a learning curve there. Offensive line is a spot where technique-wise, there's a lot of work that needs to go into it, especially coming from the JUCO level. But the physical tools are off the charts there. Yeah, he's, you saw him there. He was huge, lean, Moved well, but I mean the length. He's like a good six nine. He's Mc he's he is very similar to Brian McKinney. Probably in better shape than McKinney was because he's really not heavy at all. He might be gaining. He might need to gain some weight, uh, Markel. But he looked very good physically and was out there getting significant reps because of this opportunity. So he's a tackle. Tommy Kinsler, Bruno. He was playing left tackle, the backup left tackle. All kinds of athletic ability and size. Someone who also could play guard, but again has tackle ability. And then Samson can play tackle, and he was playing left uh, left guard. So the guard position is a little undermanned right now, but that's because you have so many guys that you're teaching how to play tackle that when you get Francis back and you only need you know two tackles at once, you're not really playing three lines, you can get somebody in there. Also, Derek Plaz, uh, incoming freshman, was out there playing left tackle. So more with the third team, he's, he's young, but shows you they're really stacking those tackle bodies, and they can always move uh, inside. Defensive line, as we flip over to the other side of the ball, one of the groups is probably going to look most different from last year. You lose a Leonard Taylor to the draft. Branson Dean, who was a great contributor in his one year at Miami, also gone. Um, and then you bring in a couple transfers. C.J. Clark, Marley Cook have a couple transfers out also at defensive end and Chance Williams and, J and Jafari Harvey. But a very talented group there that I think as a whole should take – really a, a step up in terms of production. Yeah, I think Elijah Alston the, the from Marshall, who is the top-graded transfer for for pass rushers according to Pro Football Focus. Mm -hmm. He's an improvement over Harvey. He was out there today. They think he's going to be a 10-sack kind of guy. This coaches do because of his motor. 
Marley Cook was out there today. He looked a little small, I will say. We knew that coming in. You saw him break the squat record. He has some strength despite his size. CJ Clark from NC State looked good physically. I mean, he looked ready to go, what you wanted it to look like. Defensive tackle, you were missing a couple guys. You had uh, Harrison Hunt. You had Moten. You had you had guys, but as, as Chris all mentioned after the, after the presser, Josh Horton will probably be later in the spring. I saw him walking around. The guy's enormous. Josh Horton's not that much smaller than Justin Scott. Mm -hmm. Those Both those guys are like what you want it to look like. So you'll get him back at the end of spring. You'll get uh, Justin Scott in the summer. So you'll get some more war daddy types at D-Tac where they look the part with those two, also both very athletic guys. Seen him on the basketball court, both those guys throwing down some ducks. So anyways, get those guys back. They weren't out there today. Um, so that's a position that we'll get some – some reinforcements. Jared Harrison Hunt looked good. I like CJ Clark in particular, kind of jumped out size wise. Uh, on the edges, you had Nigel Lee Kelly out, Mesador out, possibly back in spring. He was out there walking around, seemed, seemed fine. Um, Ruben Bain is ridiculous. He's wearing number four now, and he was blowing up swing passes, the dominating tackles, pass rush against the run, awareness. I mean, the guy is. Everywhere. He's a complete defensive end, total impact player. Behind him, Jaden Wayne, we know what he can do. He got some snaps. Um, but that's a position that's had some injuries. Marquise Lightfoot got some snaps, which was nice to see. But you're missing, again, Kelly, Mesador, Cole McConaughey is another one that I think will play more at the end of spring, but is out for a couple of practices. He looked big wearing the number 44, which I think gets, gets some people excited to see, see that one. Um, and he looked huge, but he wasn't able to play today. So, you know, we'll see who steps up and makes things happen at that position. Ruben Bain, I would put him, you know, I'd be I'd tread very lightly with him because two plays and you see all you need to see from him. Put him in put him in block and plaster. Oh, man. Right? Yeah. He's unbelievable. He's better than he was last time I saw him in practice. Linebackers, man. That that group took a big jump last season with Coach Derek Nicholson at the helm there. Talking to the recruits yesterday, it seems like all the recruits love him as well. I mean, I think he's a star budding star on this Miami staff for sure. Um, but how did that group look today on the hoof? I know they're going to pass the eye test. You're missing Mount Noah. So put him, you know, he'll be an all ACC preseason guy. Wesley Besaint did some nice things. Uh, Popo Aguirre got the start. Then you had Pulliam getting some reps. You had Aldarius Hayes out there doing his thing. Um, you know, you had guys at linebacker. Then you also have the position that is the Sam linebacker, sort of nickel linebacker for the guy that's more of a safety slash linebacker, you know, playing coverage, guys that can really, really run. And you saw Bobby Washington and um, Cam Pruitt from Mobile, Alabama, the true freshman, getting a lot of reps at that position. Both guys looked fast. I think Cam Pruitt's a guy. Bobby Washington got a lot of hype for some of his offseason testing because he's just such a freak. And he's going to play a role if he can, you know, just keep it together. Cam Pruitt is getting a lot of hype. We talked about it on this podcast before, and now seeing it, I can see why he's going to need to gain some weight. But the guy can fly, and he does bring some versatility with what he can do. Former safety, former receiver, run and hit guy, tremendous striking ability, and very smart. Secondary room, I think this is probably going to be the one that's most scrutinized this spring. All the fans are going to have their eyes on that room and you you'd probably expect another addition or two to that room after spring it, you know is all said and done you bring in a couple safeties mish powell from washington who he can play all all, all across the board there in the, in the defensive backfield and then savion riley from vanderbilt at safety as well obviously Daryl porter coming back cornerback but that room any surprises there and, and how do these new additions look damari brown out for spring, or at least part of spring. You saw Cristobal talking about that. Porter, rock solid. Um, and then Jadis Richard looks good. To me, my the top three corners, I think, are good. With Porter, to me, all ACC, and he's an experienced guy. He's been in the weight room. Knows what he's doing. Don't worry about him. Healthy. Uh, Jadis Richard, long and talented. Had some great moments against FSU. Damari Brown. Got a lot of people excited. Big hitter can do some things. So those three I like. The depth there leaves something to be desired. Robert Stafford was out there, which is a good good to see him. Um, but I think that could be a position you add someone in the portal just to add some depth. And it's also interesting to see Ryan Mack when he gets here. 
I don't think people have pegged Ryan Mack as an instant kind of playing guy when he first got him committed. But seeing how he looked in the offseason, he's not as small as I maybe I, I thought he was. He's probably about 5'10", which is fine, 5'11", um, and super polished. He could tackle too. He might come in there and be that fifth guy, you know, which would be a big boost. But guys will get reps. Again, you don't have you have Demetrius Freeney out there as well, mm-hmm. the junior college transfer from uh, California. So you got some guys that are getting probably more reps than they would because Damari Brown is out. So that is going to be an interesting position. Safety is – you have to think there's going to be a step back when you lose two safeties to the NFL, especially someone like Camp Kitchens who's a phenomenal – forget what he ran. I mean, the guy's an All-American college player. So that will probably be a step back. Uh, Meech Powell from Washington, who you mentioned, he was out there wearing number zero, looked good. He can also cover. He's a former corner, started at games at corner for Washington, so he brings that dynamic. Jaden Harris is the one I would say don't forget about. You know, Savian Riley from Vanderbilt, the transfer, will play. Zaquan Patterson, who I'll talk about in a second, will play. But Jaden Harris, he, someone's got to unseat him from the starting lineup because he's played, he's fast, he's physical, he does what Coach Gidry wants. Coach Gidry likes him, has always liked him at safety, wanted him at safety. So he's kind of like maybe I'll call it Coach Gidry, I don't say a pet project, but someone Gidry's had a vision for. And he has size and speed, and he can tackle. So he's an interesting guy to watch. Saquon Patterson, top 75 player. Glad he's here spring. He's got the size. You expect him to play. You watch the games he played nationally last year. He's the best player on the field against with some five stars all around him. Can blitz. Really did some damage blitzing uh, in some of those national games. He can play special teams. Coverage-wise, he's going to have to work on how grabby he is at times, but he has some ability to cover as well. Maybe not what Mish Powell does, but – he brings a physical element. He's wearing number 20. Reminds me a little bit of James Williams when he was a young player and able to play. Uh, probably a better tackler than James because he's lower to the ground. Jadis Richard, you mentioned him, but I'm really excited about him. I know he has some interest from the NFL, already has those traits. We saw didn't really get that opportunity until the Florida State game last year. Um, not, not that he didn't get playing time before that, but really was thrust into that game and did a great job there uh so i think he's a guy who they really need to rely on this season yeah a lot of upside and i think there was question about safety corner nickel i think outside corner for him is going to be a spot and we'll see where it goes so we're going to have these sorts of tidbits and updates every day on this show you know we'll, we'll bring you as we've always done on the website but again now in this daily format excited to be able to bring this stuff to you guys on the go, right? So this is just day one, early impressions. Some guys still going to come back from injury, as, as D mentioned, in different position groups. But overall, the roster has – the talent level has just completely been flipped from when Mario first came in here. Yeah, yeah I was talking to somebody about how I'm doing this podcast daily, and someone inside the building he said, good timing. Yeah. This is someone who's pretty honest about the team. But he said, listen – Good timing. We got a team this year. So we'll see. So as we transition to our next topic here, D, you and I were out at the Under Armour Miami camp yesterday, get a really good in-person look at a lot of these top 2025 and a handful of 2026 kids as well out there. But it was fun to be out there. It was my first time in one of these camps in five, six years, seeing a lot of familiar faces out there. But as you said in your write-up on Kane's Insight, if you have not checked that out, D had an in-depth breakdown. A lot of stuff we'll talk about now, but if you want to check that out on the website from yesterday's Under Armour Miami camp, you can go on there right now to canesinsight.com, completely free, and you will find it there. Um, but, of course, this segment is brought to you by our friends at Closure Investigative Agency. Is your ex-partner failing to pay child support? You deserve better. Let Closure Investigative Agency help you. Let's go get your money. Background checks, cheating spouses, corporate investigations, insurance investigations, legal investigations, employee theft investigations, domestic services, missing persons, surveillance services, and more. Closure Investigative Agency. Contact them at 561-437-6080 or info at ciagency.net. Five-star Google rated and the entire state of Florida is covered. So D, looking at some of the top guys that we saw out there, we'll go across the board here, but 
I want to start with a guy out of Homestead that we recently had on the Canes Inside podcast as well. Brad Tejeda and I had him as a guest. Was very impressed with him in terms of, of the interview that we did. And at the receiver spot, Cortez Mills was as impressive as anybody yesterday. To me, Cortez Mills was the best receiver hands down. He was on par with some of the guys we've talked about at that position, whether it's JoJo Trader or whoever locally that have been the guy locally. He has been maybe not Jeremiah Smith just because of the physical tools that, that Smith had, size and everything else, but Mills has some length, huge hands. He's His 7-on-7 seven seven, uh, GM, Jose Duazo, told me that he needed to buy him new gloves because his hands were too big, and you saw that in the camp when he was going over guys and mossing him and how easily he plucked the ball. Has, again, six one. looked every bit of it, maybe a little taller. Not the biggest guy, but not a total stick where you say you're worried about it. He'll be fine. And he's smooth. He gets in and out of his breaks, was creating tons of separation. And, again, when he needed to make a contested catch, he was able to do so without a problem going up and over. I was there filming. We put it on the Canes inside Twitter. He went right up and over a uh, defensive back and, and made a phenomenal very, very excited. And we have the play here. And I mean, this is a kid who's a big time player. I mean, series, you see this. Oh, yeah, no, it's uh, this is what this I was right. This is me filming here, get my amateur camera work. But look at that. So, a guy that can get in and out of his uh, breaks, who can go up and get it, and who has speed and is 6 1. And you had him on the show. We had him on the show. You can go look at that on YouTube. Great interview. Every by all accounts, a super smart kid, good kid. That's a big time player any mm -hmm. year. I know receivers down nationally. Maybe that'll cause this guy to rise up a little bit. But to me, this guy's a big time player every year, and he showed that at the camp. Another guy, Josh uh, Josh Moore out of out of uh, West Broward. Talk about someone who looked the part. Huge, extremely strong. Um, every bit of six three. Catch catch radius was ridiculous. And we came on this podcast, and pe there were other. Guys locally getting maybe getting more attention. And we said, listen, Cortez Mills, Josh Moore. Those are the two to circle from a Miami Canes fan standpoint because Moore's not getting the attention, but he is a guy. He got hurt last year. His hip was hurt. He didn't put up the production as a junior. They maybe caught the recruiting rankings. But his sophomore year was huge, extremely productive, over 1,000 yards. Killed it in Miami's camp. And then, I mean, you saw him today or yesterday, what he was able to do in the air. I mean, the guy – he, I saw a play where he was – he mossed multiple people, but I saw a play right in front of me where he had a you know, a cut inside, in breaking route, caught the ball, beat the guy off the route, and then he was going so fast, there was a little fence at the end, and he couldn't slow down up the hill, and he just leapt the fence, I mean, like effortlessly. And this is a big dude, you know, so very, very impressed with, uh, with Josh Moore. Speaking of big dudes, a couple defensive linemen out there, more than a couple, but but – Want to talk about a couple guys? Floyd Bucard, we have up here um, on the on the picture, a guy who just transferred down to Miami Central, won MVP. I mean, you and I were walking around, and out of the corner of my eye, when the drills first started, I see I see this big guy bending and turning around the corner, and one, you know, I think it was one of the shuttle uh, or the three cone drills that they did, and I and I started tapping. I said, "D, there's a kid over there," and at first we didn't know who it was started talking to some people and they said he had recently transferred down from Mobile, Alabama, originally out of Canada, but talk about a, a guy who can move at that size. You get, yeah, you called it. I mean, just off the first drill, first movement, you said, this is the guy. And then from that moment, he carried it on to everything else, the rest of the drills. And then when he got to one-on-ones completely dominant, I mean, he his lateral quicks. He beat everybody with the same, you know, just shuffle, you know, just quick side to side, beat him off the snap. And went basically untouched up the field. That happened about four or five times during one on ones. He was the MVP, thickly built kid, about six two, six three, but but heavy without being fat. I mean, look how he's moving in the in these change of direction drills at, at that size, right? I, I understand he used to be a linebacker, so similar to Hakeem Mesador, a linebacker who ended up being a defensive lineman. They said this guy's a deep tackle, um, so the movement skills are tremendous. He was really dominant. He was an ice hockey player in Canada, as I understand. You know, you talked to him. He was a really smart kid, right, when you had did the interview? Yeah, awesome kid. And it's funny because we had one of his former coaches from Canada actually tweet at us yesterday when we had put out a video saying, I can't, I coached this kid. He was the most respectful, you know, kid. So, I mean, obviously people coming out and saying that have, you know, 
no reason for them not to say if it's not true, right? And I agree. That was the initial impression I got. Seems like a the type of guy character wise that Mario and the staff is looking to add to the roster for sure. No, no question about it. So to me, kid like that is central. I think his recruitment is about to blow up. Would love to see Miami get involved there. There's still time. It's early in his recruitment, but it's about to escalate real quickly once some of this film gets out, which all the teams could pretty much see what the drills and everything else. They have they have private videos that the Under Armour camp fills themselves, so they'll be able to see that. I don't know what his measurable measurables are going to be. I bet they're going to be probably pretty good. Definitely change of direction. And he's at Central, which is a feeder school. And he, his teammate Ezekiel Marcellin was at practice today with his family. So Roland Smith, obviously a Central legend. So you had all these guys, all these ties to Central. Savage Joseph is another guy on staff that I think needs to be given some credit there. He was at FSU for a year, came came down down to Miami, and has a lot of ties in the community there as well. Switching gears to another central player is Randy Adrika, who was basically side by side with um, w with uh, Bucard the whole time. They were they were they inseparable. They're going to be playing defensive tackle together for the, for Central on their quest for another state title. Different kind of player, longer, just a nice combination of height and strength. Sometimes you get tall guys that aren't strong, or you get strong guys that are real squatty. He's tall, lean, but strong as a defensive tackle. Will most likely play inside. Almost definitely will play inside. I thought his size looked good. Didn't have the array of moves. Was mostly bull rush, but he was winning his reps because of his his strength, his length, and his just serious demeanor. You know, he really very nice kid when we interviewed him. And again, all these interviews are going up on YouTube. If you haven't seen them already, I'm going to write them up to as 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 tech stories on canesinsight.com. So check those out uh, on the forums. But this kid was very serious. Both of them really. Sometimes you see these defensive tackles and you see them goofing around. I'll, there's a player I won't name. When they're going to FSU a couple of years ago that I saw him at camp. His body was terrible. Four-star kid. Attitude was terrible. Trying to basically, you know, got gas quick. Just off a of camp, you could tell the guy was not going to make it, and he hasn't. But a guy like Adarika, very serious about his business, and that was a very good sign. I don't know if he's like a Ruben Bain or Blunt type of prospect athletically. He's not a bad athlete, but he, I wouldn't say he's a ex super explosive dominant athlete like that. But he's someone that you take, put in your defensive tackle rotation, and feel pretty good about, especially given the school that he's coming from. That's going to be a, a very tough defense to face this year, that central defense with Ezekiel Marcelin as well, as you said. Um, so a few more guys to talk about here, D, that, that caught our attention, right? Some young guys we'll get into. Uh, in, in just a second here, but anyone else off the top of your head that as you have in your write up here, but really the guys that, that you were intrigued with yesterday, Ben Hanks, no yeah. secret with him, defensive back, cornerback out of Booker T baseball player, which I love the multi-sport kids, very skinny, very similar to Cormani McLean size wise length, good length, but skinny. We'll need to gain some weight, but this guy was just a pure cover corner. He was in receivers' hip pockets all day, several times. He was able to use his length to go and almost snatch the ball. Had a couple interceptions and a couple pass breakups, just snatching the ball like he was running the route like a receiver. I mean, he didn't even he didn't even jump the route necessarily. He was in position and just extended his arms. Um, so really impressed with his coverability, is his patience, his his hips, footwork, and then he's a long guy with ball skills. So he looked very good. Um, Amari, Chris Ewald. Oh yeah, Chris Ewald, body wise, I thought looked good. Um, he's stronger than I thought. Tall. Amari Wallace from Central. He played a little bit of nickel, but he'll be a safety for Miami. I thought he looked he looked probably better at covering than like someone like Cam Kitchens did at the same age. Probably more of, of a true cover guy that can also be that deep safety. Um, Greg Thomas, Greg Zay Thomas from American Heritage, huge. He also did that same hurdle that uh, yeah. that Josh Moore did. So those are some of the guys, but you were on a whole other side. So you saw different players because Malachi Tony looked looked really good. Obviously, the you know he's a couple years away uh, out of American Heritage, but he was as dominant as anybody out there at the receiver spot, in my opinion. Uh, Bryce Fitzgerald out of Columbus, another guy that we spoke to. That interview is going to be coming up as well. But very smooth athlete, plays both sides of the ball at Columbus as a basketball player as well. Uh, probably a safety at the next level, but. He's a guy I'm very, I'm very, very high on. And then Tay Harris out of Georgia, 200 pounds running a 438. Th those are NFL combine elite type numbers at the cornerback position. So 
he's a guy to watch for. I, I don't know Miami's interest level there, maybe an SEC type kid. Um, but those are some of the guys that that stood out to me for sure. Oh, Winston Watkins. I think he won MVP. I don't think we mentioned him in the write up here, but physically uh, looked really good, strong hands. Um, and I was very impressed with him yesterday at Naples. Yeah. So 2026 kids at Dia Bell out of American heritage to me was the best quarterback. I know there were other good quarterbacks. Someone else won MVP. There was a kid from California that got some attention, but to me, Dia Bell, he's a really, really good basketball player. His dad, Raja Bell, decade plus NBA experience was there watching from the sidelines. I really liked just everything he did was smooth. He's sudden. His release is sudden. The ball jumps out of his hands. He throws a tight spiral. He's accurate. He just makes it look easy and comfortable. He's not overthrowing. He's not overly trained, but at the same time, he's polished. So to me, Dia Bell, I liked him as a football player based on what I saw at Heritage last year. I like him just profile-wise with the with the bloodlines and the watching him play basketball. And then seeing him in that camp setting, he checks that box. To me, I'd be hard pressed to find. I don't know who's out there for 2026. I haven't done that homework, but he to me certainly looks like a mighty caliber guy for 2026. And again, keep checking the YouTube page, keep checking the website over the next few days. Ton of content coming from the camp, interviews, drills, one on ones, all that sort of stuff. And D, we're in the new fancy studio. We've forgotten to say it. Like this video <laughs> and subscribe. I mean, it's, it's, you blame me all the time. I, I just remembered right now, but just because we're not, in front of our laptops at home doesn't mean we shouldn't be saying like this video and subscribe to subscribe there's gonna be all kinds of stuff coming because not just the podcast that we're doing daily with multiple segments maybe you want to see one particular segment you're going to get those available those interviews we're going to have interviews with players meaning miami hurricane football players currently on the team which we haven't done really in the past now you're going to see a ton of that recruiting interviews uh recruiting breakdowns coaches um and again baseball content which we're about to get to that you're not going to get anywhere else so Get all of it. Subscribe. And uh, you don't have to watch all of it. You can pick or choose what you want, but you want to at least see it. And it's going to be coming in floods because this content is going to go to another level. Uh, we're putting in a different type of investment of money, uh, time, and uh, doing it all because of you guys and the support you guys have given us over the years. So appreciate you. And by the way, if there's something you want, let us know so we can understand to put it in the format. We're going to be have plenty of time in front of the camera with you guys. Uh, so a lot of times to get things right and to give you guys what you want. All right, coming up next on Kane's Inside Live, we're going to take a quick break here. And Javi Salas, who threw out the first pitch yesterday for Game 3 of Miami UF, will be joining us to break down the series. Aikman to throw again, and Jerome Brown's after him, and he's got it. Walsh again is well taken care of. Lofting the ball. Irvin is open. Touchdown, Miami. He's going to try to strike deep as they go down the middle, and it is. Brooks going up for Thorpe, and it's intercepted near midfield. Sean Taylor's got another one. Who else? Aikman to throw again, and Jerome Brown's after him, and he's got it. Walsh again is well taken care of. Lofting the ball. Irvin is open. Touchdown, Miami. He's going to try to strike deep as they go down the middle, and it is touchdown. Brooks going up for Thorpe, and it's intercepted near midfield. Sean Taylor's got another one. Who else? Aikman to throw again, and Jerome Brown's after him, and he's got it. Walsh again is well taken care of. Lofting the ball. Irvin is open. Touchdown, Miami. He's going to try to strike deep as they go down the middle, and it is touchdown. Brooks going up for Thorpe, and it's intercepted near midfield. Sean Taylor's got another one. Who else? Aikman to throw again, and Jerome Brown's after him, and he's got it. Walsh again is well taken care of. Lofting the ball. Irvin is open. Touchdown, Miami. He's going to try to strike deep as they go down the middle, and it is touchdown. Great Johnson, the ball by him to 
Ricks going up for Thorpe, and it's intercepted near midfield. Sean Taylor's got another one. Who else? Aikman to throw again, and Jerome Brown's after him, and he's got it. Walsh again is well taken care of. Lofting in the ball. Irvin is open. Touchdown, Miami. He's going to try to strike deep as they go down the middle, and it is touchdown. Andre Johnson with all by him. Ricks going up for Thorpe, and it's intercepted near midfield. Sean Taylor's got another one. Who else? Aikman to throw again, and Jerome Brown's after him, and he's got it. Walsh again is well taken care of. Lofting in the ball. Irvin is open. Touchdown, Miami. He's going to try to strike deep as they go down the middle, and it is touchdown. Andre Johnson with all by him. Ricks going up for Thorpe, and it's intercepted near midfield. Sean Taylor's got another one. Who else? All right. Well, thank you guys for sticking with us. We need some time to bring in a very special guest. He is Mr. Perfect himself through perfect game for the Miami Hurricanes, drafted by the Milwaukee Brewers, and threw out the first pitch at the game yesterday. Here to talk about the UMUF series. Javi Salas, excited to have him on board. Thanks for having me, D. Before that, we want to remind you guys that this segment is brought to you by Sala, Astorita, and Cox, LLC a boutique law firm focusing on securities, regulatory matters, broker, dealer, and investment advisor regulation, white collar criminal defense, complex commercial litigation, and securities arbitration litigation. The firm aggressively represents clients throughout the nation. Their lawyers have, ha have over 100 years of collective experience handling securities and white collar criminal matters, including investigations, white collar uh, regulatory proceedings, and enforcement actions in federal, state, and administrative courts. We, they've also handled investigations conducted by congressional subcommittees. You can contact them now at 561-989-9080 and check them out at salalaw.com. All right, Javi, welcome. How you doing? Good to be here, man. D is a new era of Kane's Insight, man. I'm excited for you guys. Obviously, you and Pete, um, it's great. It's tremendous, man. I'm excited for you. We got some stuff cooking with you, which people will be finding out about. Just getting you more on camera. You know, you got to get get to get the tan right. Got to get ready for your <laughs> for your media career here. I know you got the start and the spotlight here with uh, the first pitch yesterday, uh, which was awesome, man. And, uh, you know, I want to start kind of on the whole. Right. We talked about this series all off season. That was going to be a pretty, pretty, you know, big start. Now that you've seen it, if I would have told you, hey, you lose one, hang tough in a couple, would you have taken that? I think you definitely would have. I mean, you're you're talking about the fourth ranked team in the country, a team in the University of Florida that's going to come in and have arguably the best roster you're going to face all year long, right? Pound for pound. That that Florida roster is legit. And you hang tough on Friday, you beat Florida on Saturday. And then on Sunday, you get Jack Caglione, right? And that's that's kind of the story of the beast of, of University of Florida. They had the best player on the field all three nights. And on Sunday, he pitched and hit himself to a Florida victory. So, I mean, look, does Miami want to lose two or three? You don't want to make that a habit, right? Obviously, Florida's our biggest rival. It's, you know, the barometer of the early point of the season. You want to make sure that this team is set up for success moving forward. I think there's a lot of positives that we can we're certainly going to touch on, but – Look, man, I, I, I was watching that game yesterday and I saw Jack Caglione play that he's by far the best player on the field. And it was just it was inspired. It was, it was just incredible, incredible to watch, incredible to see him handle the bat and pitch. It was it was, you know, if you're a Florida fan, you're really, really lucky to have that guy on your roster. Yeah, dude, we saw I mean, I was with you on Friday. He looked like a tight end. Yeah. You know, easily. Yeah. Or D end. I mean, he's huge for being as athletic as he is. But. You know, Jim Sala gave me this idea, which is let's talk with the good, bad, and the ugly. So let's right. start with the good. What's the biggest takeaway, aside from, you know, the results? What did you see on the field that you said, okay, I feel better about this Canes team than I did going in? Right. So certainly the good you take, you, you want to look at the, the optimistic points, right? Like Saturday and Sunday starting pitching held their own against Florida. Obviously, Herrick Hernandez would want to have a better start. Unfortunately, you spot Florida and error in the first inning. They take full advantage of it. Two runs right on the board, right, you know, right off the bat. So – it's kind of one of those things where there's building blocks Saturday and Sunday. Rafe Schlesinger pitched really well, I thought, on Saturday afternoon. 
Herrick Hernandez is the same thing. And then there's some young guys in the bullpen that are really, you know, you can sort of hang your hat on. Nick Robert came in late in the game on Saturday, pitched again on Sunday, did really well. Jordan Vargas had a nice outing, his first outing, you know, in the midweek role. Gets put into a high leverage situation on Saturday, works himself into some trouble, but obviously building blocks, something that you're going to see him get much better in these situations. And then again, it's it's one of those things where, where D, this is all great experience for our young guys. I think the good part about all this is we played a lot of freshmen. There's a lot of young guys, a lot of building blocks. Daniel Covey, everyone was worried. Can he hit against big-time pitching? Answered the bell. Jason Torres answered the bell. So Miami's got a lot of building blocks. We get into ACC play now, and you know you got to continue to build. They got to de- the young guys got to develop. There's got to be an upward trajectory with this roster. I want to ask you about Torres because he's not someone I heard a lot about. I didn't see him a lot last year. Didn't hear a lot of hype about him. Like Kuwait, you knew the hype coming in. Torres, I didn't hear much about him, and I didn't see much last year replacing a major league player in Kafis. What do you what do you see from him as far as his upside? Like, what do you think he can be as he progresses in his career? So I think. I see the game through like a lens of a pitcher. I see a lot of guys that are really aggressive at the plate. It starts with Blake Sear setting the tone at the second batter. Cavay is super aggressive. Torres is super aggressive. You're seeing guys take hacks. I think Torres is one of those guys too where anything – he's like he's like a volume shooter. He's going to swing a lot. There's going to be some swing and miss, but the power is what you know what is going to set him apart. I, I really do see 15 to 20 home runs from this guy, right? Like – there is a ton of upside. Obviously, you mentioned we didn't see a whole lot of them last year. He's playing behind Kafis and, and Yo-Yo Morales, two guys we're going to see in the major leagues pretty soon. So, like, Canes fans don't really know Jason Torres, but he is a really, really solid baseball player. He's going to have protection in the lineup, presumably from the Sears and the Caves of the world. That 2-3-4 for Miami is really formidable. If, if, you know, if you're looking at getting 27 outs in a game, you want to avoid those three guys as much as possible, and Jason Torres is right in the mix of that. Do you like that approach? You mentioned just that the – Going for home runs. There were a lot of home runs this right. weekend. You saw uh, Caglione hit hit a couple. Yeah, um, he hit thirty three, I think, last year. So, or, or in his, he's had a thirty three home run season. So, do you like that approach to modern college baseball, or do you like kind of the old school style or a mix? So, I mean, the tail of the tape this weekend was a team that hit the most home runs won the game. Right, we saw it on Friday. Florida hit a couple out of the yard, especially late in the game. Saturday, Miami outslugged the Gators, and Sunday, the Gators hit five home runs. Right, so. It's a race to hit the ball out of the park. The wind was blowing out at Mark Light, which it usually does during these day games. So, you know, as a pitcher, I always fear the home run. I like to keep the ball down in the zone and avoid – if you're going to beat me, I want you to string together base hits and execute on with runners in scoring position. If you're going to elevate with today's day and age and all the uppercut swings you see in, in professional baseball trickling down to college, the home run is part of the game. So, I mean, it, Miami's going to be a roster that lives and dies by it. I think we have 24 home runs in the season already, a very young season. So – we're hitting two home run, over two home runs a game. It's going to be part of the game. It's going to be part of every series you play. It's a race to hit the ball out of the park. Now, as you get closer to the postseason, you want to see an emphasis on execution. I think early on in the year, we've seen J.D. Arteaga put on some bunts. And granted, it's it's one of those volatile arguments you have. Like, do you want a bunt? Do you not want a bunt? But in late and close games, you have to have the ability to move runners over. We're going to see some of that. I know J.D., that's a big emphasis for him. But the name of the game right now in professional baseball and college baseball is hitting the ball out of the park. And if you want to be successful, you got to hit the ball out of the park. You feel every bunt has set multiple group chats on <laughs> fire. Um, I know you're in them too. Uh, it feels like it happens every time you see one of these bunts. Um, but, um, you know, let's focus on now switching to the bad. And with the bad, I want to s- – what's something that maybe you expected it to be a certain way and you were disappointed? Like, hey, we could do this better. We just didn't do it in this series. I mean, look, you, you, you have like – building blocks on hanging tough with the Gators. But I think that narrative, like, it just gets tired. I know the fans don't want to hear it. They don't want to hear about, oh, we played them close. At the end of the game, it's a results-based industry in every sport. The University of Miami is accustomed to winning games in every sport that they play in. You lace them up for the U. You want to win, especially when you're playing a, an in-state rival like the Gators. So I think the bad was just a sense that we lost a series, right? And then that Sunday game, you know, for me, I always see, like, the Gators celebrating on your home field. It, it just sucks, man. Like, we don't like those guys. They don't like us. There's no love lost between the staffs, the players, the programs. And then you get, you know, it was a close competitive game for the most part. The Miami pushes a couple runs late with the Dorian Gonzalez grand slam. And then they hit a home run in the top of the ninth that really kind of just, you know, puts a nail in the coffin again, you know, for, for the Gators. But, you know, the bad I would say is just losing a series. And I think, you know, we've lost two midweeks in a row. We lost to UCF, lost to Florida Gulf Coast. So you want to make sure that, yes, we hung tough. There's a lot of building blocks, 
but ultimately losing a series to the Gators is just it's it's one of those things you never want to see in an in-state rival like that. It just you know it's just it's tough to swallow as a Canes fan. So the ugly this is something that we're gonna lose sleep over. Your JD, you're saying you know I'm not sure we're good enough here for the ACC or we got to get a lot better here in this area if we want to survive in the ACC based on what we've seen against good competition. So yeah. what's that area of the team where you're like, all right, they need to get a lot better. We need to get a lot more production as we head into ACC play. Right. I think, I think that my answer is twofold. I think number one, you want to clean up the errors you want to have, you don't ever want to spot teams runs, right? So we have talked about twice Friday night, first inning error, Florida gets a run. Sunday afternoon, first inning error, Florida gets a run, right? Two runs on a home run. So you got to clean up the errors. I think the other area you got to clean up is the defining of roles in the bullpen. I talked about some freshmen that got some key, you know, innings, pitching some really tight situations. Now, how do we start defining those roles and say, this is my middle relief guy. This is my setup guy. This is my closer. That's what, you know, JD, Coach Gutierrez are going to really harp in on the next couple of weeks. As you get into the meat of ACC play, that's got to be nailed down. Let me ask you the infield. You had and, – and, and a catcher. You had Jimenez sort of battling with uh, the Kiffin Tapper Urs, Ursa. Urso, yeah. yeah. So he Jimenez started to get more playing time. Sear, Dorian Gonzalez, Sear was out for a while. Now he's back. I'm sure he wants to play second base. You want to kind of get him going. And then the catcher, there's some buzz. Hey, can we get Scanlon getting some more at bat? So those three spots, how do you see that shaken up? Or do you have any sense or you think that's still very much an open question? I think it's very much an open question at catcher and second base. I think, you know, we're going to see Dorian and Sear kind of platoon, I think, because look, Dorian's hitting over 300 right now. He's got, you know, two huge home runs, two grand slams on the year. So obviously he's, if, if you hit, you're going to play. That's kind of the, the letter of the law in, in baseball, right? So can Dorian, you know, find his way into the everyday lineup? I'm not sure, but as long as he's hitting, he's going to be playing. Now for the catcher position, I've, from all my conversations with, with people close to the team, you know, it's 1A, 1B with present Scanlon. Luckily, one's a right-handed batter, one's a left-handed batter. So I would assume with left-handed pitchers, we're going to see a lot of Carlos Perez. With some righties, we're going to see uh, Jack Scanlon. So it's a good problem to have if you're JD. I know they both are good defensively. They throw the ball well. So whoever's hitting, whoever can you know sort of take over and, and you know, a couple good weeks, a couple string together, four or five good games, you could see that person or that player starting you know two or three straight ACC series. And then and then Jimenez at Jimenez shortstop. Jimenez at short, you're right, you're right. Jimenez, look. If, if it was me and it was my team, I'd go with youth. I think you want to develop youth. And, and baseball is a sport where you got to get at bats. You got to get live reps. Um, you know, it's not like football where the quarterback can hang back a year, learn the playbook, and, you know, get better. Baseball, you got to get your 200 at bats in every year. Look, the guys who go play professionally, professional teams want to see did they play close to 100 games, right? Because the professional season is 140 and the minor leagues, 162 at the major league level. So, got to get your at bats, got to get your reps in. Jimenez had two big errors this weekend. It's a learning point. You're gonna you got to take those bumps, and if he's your guy for the future, you got to find out right now. He's got to be getting those those reps at shortstop. Got to be getting those at bats, and you got to see what you have in him. I want to talk about Cuvier for a second, just because yeah. he's such a superstar in the making. It seems like you know, we've seen some great slug and third baseman. Our guy Harold Martinez, yeah. Yo Yo just left, and he had some of the best power in the ACC. Now Cuvier, we have enough. Not a huge sample size, but you've seen him against lesser teams. You've seen him against the Gators. What do you see for like? What's your what's your assessment of him as we sit here today in March, having seen a few series of his his play? He's a monster. I mean, he's an absolute monster. He's physically imposing, which you don't really see for freshmen. I mean, he's 18 years old. He's he's right you know right out of high school. This guy's you know six months removed from from his prom, right? And all of a sudden, he's thrust into batting third at the University of Miami, right? So. For me as a pitcher, I'm beyond impressed with what he can do at the plate. He's not afraid. I think, you know, as a pitcher, I saw Friday night Kevin O'Sullivan hit him twice, right? Yep. It wasn't necessarily – I don't know if it was intentional. One of them was after a mound visit. So I can <laughs> imagine that conversation said, hey, miss in and not in for a strike. And if you hit him, we'll live with it. So I saw a kid that gets hit twice. There's nothing that – you know, he wasn't scared. Saturday, he comes and hits a huge home run in a clutch situation. So for me as a pitcher, man, like that guy's got all the makings of a superstar. And you hear his quotes after the game about, you know, work ethic and what he wants to be. He, for all intents and purposes, if he answers the phone on draft day last year, I'm sure he's drafted in the you know top couple rounds. And, and he's in a minor league organization right now working his way up to a full, you know, full season club. 
And we've talked to guys. We, you know, we talked to a lot of the same people that say that, you know, Daniel Covey could play in our minor league organization right now and be super successful, right? So Miami got a really good one. Um, he's only going to continue to develop. This weekend was the proof of concept for him, I think. You know, we were kind of worried he hadn't faced anybody. Has he seen real college pitching yet? Answered the bell. Um, the kid is the goods, man. I think he's a superstar. We got to rally around him as Canes fans and, you know, make him feel like the superstar that he is. And, you know, I think the sky's the limit, man. I, I'm, I'm excited for him. I'm excited for his trajectory. I think he's a better athlete that leads on. I think people think he's a big, you know, bouldering guy. He plays a really good third base, made a really nice catch on Friday when we were had a shift and he made, went back into short uh, left field and, and made a you know tremendous catch. So Daniel Covey is going to be the next face of the program. I think he already is. And, you know, we got to get out there and support him. All right. Last thing, especially for those people who aren't maybe having – caught up to the season yet they're yeah. they're trying to get into it what are you looking to see from this canes team going forward what are you watching now that you've seen a little bit about what they are what are you watching going forward to say this this is what they need to do to have a successful season the acc is tough I, I looked up the, the the top 25 today there's six teams in the top 25 as of today's poll right so week in and week out you're going to be challenged i think 500 team in the acc play gets you probably close to hosting a regional so we got to develop and win at the same time, which is the hardest thing to do as a, as a collegiate baseball program, right? We're going to have a lot of youth. Um, you look around the infield, you got Cave as a freshman, Jimenez is a freshman, uh, Sears, a sophomore, Torres is a sophomore. Three out of the four guys haven't really played much. Jason Torres is really getting his first experience in, in collegiate baseball. So you're going to, you're going to have some learning bumps along the road, but I think this coach has to trust the development, trust guys like Darren Fenster, Laz Gutierrez, have been around the block, been in professional baseball, know what it's like to develop talent and win at the same time with the expectations at Miami. That being said, we got a really tough ACC series this week with the University of Virginia coming in. They're 10-1. and one. Um, They played really well at a tournament up in Jacksonville, beat a Big Ten team in Iowa, beat an SEC team in Auburn. So this team is battle-tested already. And University of Virginia is a really good baseball program. We, we always talk about them at the end of the year, always a national seed, or at least in the conversation. So it's going to be a great test for Miami, back-to-back, -back, loaded weekends. It's going to set the stage for what the ACC play will look like. It's going to be 10 series. They're all going to be tough. And, you know, Miami's got to, got to really start, you know, w stacking ball games, winning. You want to see a little bit of a win, a win streak. we got a Wednesday game against Stonehill. Build some momentum there going into the weekend and then into ACC play. All right, so Canes fans, this is going to be the spot for Canes baseball. You're going to get more content, better content than you get anywhere else. I mean, we got Javi Salas straight from the first pitch to the podcast the next day, and we're going to keep it rolling. So stay tuned for all that kind of content, plus the football and the recruiting and basketball stuff that you're used to. So appreciate you like and subscribe. We are going daily. It is not going to stop. And, um, again, if you anything else you want, let us know. But we think we're going to give it to you because we're going to give you a lot uh, in the months to come. And we're jacked up, man. Thank you for joining us. Javi, appreciate you. Thanks, Dean. Thanks, Pete.